Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. We're glad you're here and we're glad that uh, we can come and worship freely. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. God of our salvation, you see the world laid waste with false worship, injustice, and indifference. And we tremble at your anger. Only in your tears, born out of vast love, do we find hope. Open to us the way of your tears, the way that leads us back to love. Teach us to serve you, serve you alone, the God who weeps for us. For the world is the God whose compassion comes to us, to meet us, and to forgive us. In Christ's name, amen. Also, before you start, Warren, I forgot to introduce Dr. John Wells. Dr. Wells, I'm sorry. You're here. <laughs> Dr. Wells is uh, the 22nd president from Emory and Henry College, uh, and he, about a year ago, he did a workshop for all of us clergy, and he promised us that he would preach for us in in our churches. So, uh, what a gift! What a gift that is. Uh, but. He is known as, if you look at your little sheet, it tells all about Dr. Wells and it tells about the college. And one of the, th I didn't know a whole lot about Emory and Henry, so it was a very educational workshop that we went to with a lot of good stuff in it. But Dr. Wells is a visionary and a strategist. Um, they, at Emory and Henry, they have the Appalachian Trail Program, an equestrian program. I didn't know that either about Emory and Henry. Uh, a visual and performing arts center, a Bartlett Crow field station for research in environmental science, a liberal arts-based engineering program, and the Appalachian Center for Studies in Civic Engineering. 
So I want you to give Dr. Wales a warm welcome this morning for being here. Dr. Wales, will you stand up and let them see you? <laughs> I'm sorry, Warren. Go ahead. <laughs> Good morning. Our opening hymn is page 85, We Believe in One True God. 85, please stand. Remain standing. Our affirmation of faith is the Apostles' Creed found on 881. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
seated. Now we come to a time in our service where we share our joys and our concerns. Gracious and holy God, we praise you. We thank you that we are able to be here and to worship you. And we remember that worship is work. And to do the work of worship, it takes time, it takes practice, it takes commitment, it takes passion. And Lord, we get joy from that. And Lord, help us to bask in the joy of worship and to bask in the joy of being present with each other and to be present with you. Lord, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, and the beautiful gift that you have given us through, the, through Christ's life and his ministry and his presence with us. And Lord, we pray for all of those who are sick, all of those who are struggling, all of those who are, are sad and lonely and depressed. We pray for those who need God's love. We pray that you would bring them to a place where they realize the need that they have for, for your love and your grace and your mercy. And Lord, we just pray that you will just empower us to be your disciples. Empower us, come to us, give us a spirit of, of love, a spirit of grace, a spirit of mercy. Lord, come to us once more. Come to us, come to us, come to us. Transform us into the people that you would have us to be. Lord, now let us pray as you have taught us together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now will the ushers come forward for God's tithes and our offerings.
gracious and generous God, we celebrate your creation. Help us to be good stewards of your creation, to be gentle and kind and, and to help preserve what we have. And Lord, we praise you for the gift of Jesus Christ. Lord, our salvation and creation go hand in hand, and we celebrate them both and help us to be good stewards of the salvation that you have given us. In Christ's name, amen. You may be seated. A reading this morning from the Acts of the Apostles. While Paul was waiting for Silas and Timothy in Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he argued in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons, and in the marketplace every day with those who chanced to be there. Some also of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers met him, and some said, what will this babbler say? Others said, He seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he preached Jesus and the resurrection. And they took hold of him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new teaching is which you present, for you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. So Paul, standing in the middle of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all men life and breath and everything. And he made from one every nation of men to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their habitation, that they should seek God in the hope that they might feel after him and find him. Yet he is not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. And even as some of your poets have said, 
for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought to not think of that the deity is like gold or silver or stone or representation by art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all men everywhere to repent. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, my goodness, to, uh, to follow a beautiful reading and uh, the beautiful music that we've heard today is uh, quite an honor. I'm happy to be back in Lenore City. Uh, I spent a lot of my time growing up here in Lenore City. My uh, grandfather, uh, Jim Crumley, ran uh, the Shell Station uh, on uh, Hill Street, and uh, uh, he and my grandmother, uh, she ran a taut ship, I got to tell you, uh, but I enjoyed, uh, enjoyed spending lots of time here in, in Lenore City many years ago. My mother is a 1956 graduate of uh, Lenore City High School, and uh, so this really is uh, like, uh, like being at home, so uh, it is very nice to be here, and you're very kind. Uh, to, uh, to, to indulge me to be here. Emory and Henry College is an institution that goes back and was founded by the Holston Conference in 1836. Uh, I'm always proud to say that uh, our charter uh, at Emory and Henry uh, is six weeks older than the charter of Emory University. We were also named for uh, Bishop John Emory. So we're six weeks older than Emory University. So we're the true and original Emory. <laughs> That's just a little fly-by-night thing they do down in Atlanta. But it is, uh, it is certainly good to be here today. One of my favorite pieces of scripture we just, uh, we just heard, and uh, I've entitled the sermon today, The Great Conversation. The Apostle Paul goes and he meets the great philosophers at the Areopagus, and there he has an engagement where he asks them questions. <coughs> You know, we, uh, we live in an angry age. I think that for those of us who are people of faith, I think we have an opportunity to be uh, those agents of peace and reconciliation in the world in which we live today. Too often times we're quick to judge, we're quick to uh, find our temper before we find common ground. And we seem to be in a day and age where it's easy to go from zero to very angry very quickly. And yet what we have as an example that we read there in the New Testament, we have the example of civil conversation. We have the example of actually the apostle going and engaging the philosophers with whom he knows he does not have agreement. And yet he goes to them... And he has the conversation. In some ways, it's an example for us. Can we not draw from that example the idea that regardless of whether or not we agree or disagree with one another, we should still be about the great conversation. We should still try to find ways to find common ground. When I was growing up in East Knoxville... Uh, my father was a uh, United Methodist minister, and uh, as I say, my, my mother, uh, uh, you know, after she graduated from Lenore City High School, went on to Tennessee Wesleyan, and my father on to Emory and Henry, so we know Methodist higher education in my family, and uh, they actually met at Candler School of Theology at, uh, at Emory University uh, after, uh, after their, they had graduated from their respective institutions. Back then, seminaries were about 30 to 1 male to female, and yet my father still was able to court my mother, uh, which is some indication that uh, God is very gracious. But uh, at any rate, um, but when I was growing up in East Knoxville, I used to mow yards. And in fact, I feel like in the early 1980s, I mowed every yard in East Knoxville. So if you saw the uh, yards in East Knoxville in the early 80s and you liked the, uh, the, the job that was done there, that was me. I did that. Uh, <laughs> but my grandfather uh, uh, used to uh, deal in uh, snapper uh, lawn mowers, and he told me one day that I could select one if I uh, uh, agreed to go into business for myself and, uh, and to mow yards. He was an entrepreneur, and he was teaching me those valuable lessons. 
the lessons of entrepreneurship and the legend and the lesson that uh, that an honest day's work is uh, is an honorable thing and uh, we ought to be about that. So teaching me a work ethic. But when I was mowing yards, there were two gentlemen who lived on opposite ends of the neighborhood there at Holston Hills, where I was raised, and and uh, they were both uh, World War One veterans. They had known one another, in fact, uh, early in their life. Both had graduated from Knoxville High School and, and uh, before joining the Army and going off to, uh, to fight in the war. But somewhere along the line, these two men who had actually been friends, had been classmates, and as each one uh, told it, had, uh, had uh, at least on one or two occasions, uh, dated the same woman. And uh, uh, so they, they really had a past and a history together. But for some reason, they had grown estranged from one another. And even after over a half century of being uh, estranged from one another, uh, when I would mow one of their yards, and both men were widowers, and when I would mow one of their yards, they, they, they would invariably ask about the other one. And uh, sometimes with uh, references and names that, that shouldn't be repeated in our beautiful United Methodist Church. And uh, they would ask about one another, and I would always relate the story of how the other one's health was doing. And, and, um, the, but a curious thing happened. The more I got to know both of these gentlemen, uh, and the more engaged I became uh, with them summer by summer mowing their yards, it became very painfully clear to me that uh, the reasons for their being separated from one another were no longer reasons that either one of them remembered. And I would press them to tell me, what exactly is it that Mr. Uh, X has done or Mr. Y has done? And they couldn't come up with a good enough reason. From time to time, I would ask them while trying to be as respectful as I could, don't you think it's time that, uh, I mean, you just live a couple of miles apart from one another. Don't you think it's time that you get, get uh, to, uh, back to know one another? I and mean, you have such a long history, and, and uh, uh, without pointing out the obvious, both of you are headed into the winter of life, and you don't particularly want to, uh, to go out of this world without some element of reconciliation. Uh, but both, uh, from till the very end, refused the opportunity for reconciliation. I wish the story had a happy ending. It doesn't. Uh, the truth of the matter is both left this world without having made any effort at reconciliation. Here's the thing. You know, we, uh, we, we have it upon us and upon our hearts and upon our duty that the apostle even gave us to be in conversation even with those who disagree with us. We have it upon our hearts, we have it upon our obligation to engage with one another in a way that affirms the other's humanity and that we find that common ground. If it in fact is there to be found, we should at least try to find it. You know, as I think about uh, having conversations these days, too oftentimes our goal is to simply prove someone else wrong and if they can't see the wisdom of our worldview, we're done having fellowship with them. Let me tell you, I don't think that is exactly what, uh, what Jesus has in mind for us. I think, in fact, even when we have disagreements with one another, be they religious disagreements, if they are personal disagreements, if they're political disagreements, we still have an obligation to find the humanity in those with whom we disagree. It's a tall order, and, uh, and it's tough to do, and yet uh, the Lord has called us to actually find uh, and take up our cross and walk, and part of that very difficult task is to find reconciliation with others. Let me give three quick, very quick lessons uh, very quickly that, uh, that I think uh, are relevant for us, and uh, we can take from uh, Paul's interaction there at the Areopagus and the negative example of, uh, of those two gentlemen, both of whom I knew as fine, upstanding gentlemen who simply had failed to find the opportunity for reconciliation, and I know that they both regretted it. But I'll say this. I think when we have conversations with others, let's go into the great conversation with this, with a desire that both of us are authentically seeking truth. In other words, that we see those people with whom we come into contact and have conversation, not as someone to be conquered with our words, but as partners in conversation to try to understand truth. 
I think that's the first and foremost thing. You know, too often times in a world where we communicate through offensive memes on uh, social media, where we attempt to diminish the humanity of other people, that the reality is when we come into contact with someone and we see them face to face, it's a whole lot easier uh, to see the humanity in someone when you're having a face to face conversation. One of the things in this world that I think we've paid a heavy price for, email is convenient, but somehow or another arguments that happen over email are always worse than the ones that we have face to face. Somehow seeing one another's humanity, being able to take advantage of experiencing one another in three dimensions, somehow or another that, that brings us back more often than not from the brink of denying the other person's humanity. What the apostle did is he went to the Areopagus. He went to have the conversation with those he knew he was going to be in disagreement with. And he went not simply to, uh, to prove them wrong, but to engage in the conversation and in the discussion. When we, when we view our interlocutors in conversation as partners with us, as opposed to enemies, if we begin from that standpoint, then perhaps we can bring uh, a little bit of light instead of so much heat. The second lesson would be this. If we're partners in truth, let's also do this. Let's, let's hold one another to the same reciprocal rules. In other words, let's, uh, let's go into a conversation not with the idea that we're going to disprove the other person's worldview and that we're going to uh, have that person uh, live uh, under rules that we ourselves are not willing to live under. You know, there's the old saying, uh, Jesus loves me, but he can't stand you. We can't have that uh, when we go into a conversation. We've got to have some reciprocity where we intend to live under the same rules and uh, the same rules of engagement. So looking for truth together, finding the opportunity to live under the same rules together, and finally this, can we as Christians agree that we are going to approach this world with kindness? You know, when, uh, when we see so much unpleasantness in the world and we see so much in terms of trying to devalue and dehumanize other people, can't we commit to living in kindness? Over and again, Jesus refused to fall into the trap of regarding people as being uh, a, a, a member of one of two groups, friend or enemy. He, he rejected that over and over again. In fact, he constantly was making the circle bigger to bring even those who regard, were regarded as less, such as the Samaritans, into the conversation, even those who lived by philosophy and not by faith with whom he engaged at the Areopagus, uh, in the apostle. There is the example that we don't simply and merely fit people into those categories. We see their humanity. We see what, uh, we see what they are walking around with, and we have a spirit of kindness. You know, that's not a trite lesson in the Scripture, and it's not an easy lesson for which to live. Uh, but approaching the world with kindness, that but doesn't exactly sound like taking up a cross, but the reality is it can often be. Uh, you know, that because God made us, he understands everything that, uh, that is a limitation to us. He knows we have pride. He knows we have the tendency to see things in insulting ways. But here's the thing. If someone else wants to devalue and diminish us, we will leave them to their soul competency to deal with that with God. But from us, let us be relieved from the burden of hatred, of unkindness, and of incivility. Let us follow the way that Christ has led, and uh, let us be about a world of civility and kindness. You know, when I was uh, an undergraduate at, uh, at Carson Newman, I, uh, uh, like I say, I didn't graduate from Emory & Henry, my father did, but, but somewhere along the line, having been uh, the president of Emory & Henry, I've gotten a blood transfusion somewhere and uh, have become an Emory & Henry kind of person, but... Uh, uh, but, uh, but there is one of the things that I used to love when I was on faculty at Carson Newman, and that was, uh, that was teaching history and teaching political science. And occasionally one would run across those examples in history that would give a positive example of actually what the gospel, I think, is trying to preach. And one involved two former presidents of the United States 
uh, William Howard Taft and Theodore Roosevelt. In 1901, when Leon Cholesgaard shot uh, President McKinley and President McKinley's wounds became infected and he, and he died, and Theodore Roosevelt became the President of the United States, he immediately turned to a man that he had already come to see as a political ally, William Howard Taft, from a very distinguished Ohio family, and he appointed uh, William Howard Taft the governor of the Philippines. And they were close political allies, so much so that when Theodore Roosevelt announced that he would not run for re-election in 1908, he supported William Howard Taft for the Republican nomination. Many of us know the story. Taft was uh, elected that year in 1908, defeating uh, William Jennings Bryan for the third time, uh, and uh, became president of the United States. But somewhere along the line, he and Theodore Roosevelt had a falling out. So much so that the two men refused to speak to one another and actually became very antagonistic to one another in public and uh, exchanged uh, epithets toward one another, not befitting uh, the fact that both men had served as chief magistrate of this great republic. So embittered had Theodore Roosevelt become that in 1912 he announced that even though he was not the Republican nominee for president, he was going to run an independent campaign, knowing good and well that he was going to split the Republican vote and send Woodrow Wilson to the White House. And he did it to get Taft out of the White House. So embittered were the two men that their respective children actually intervened to try to get them to find points of reconciliation, but both men refused. They both, uh, they both had very large egos. President Taft was just large. Uh, but they refused to have any conversation with one another. But then, late in 1918, at the Blackstone Hotel in Chicago, Former President Roosevelt was having dinner by himself when into the restaurant came the former President of the United States, William Howard Taft. Quite by accident, they were running into one another at one of at what at, was at that time one of the great hotels of Chicago. When President Taft walked in and he saw President Roosevelt, the, uh, the, the restaurant became very quiet and there was a stillness because people were wondering, what is about to happen? I wish we knew the full depth of the story. We don't. What we do know is this, from what people saw when, uh, when the two interacted, uh, President Taft walked over to the table where President Roosevelt was dining alone. And again, as everyone was expecting some sort of fireworks to occur, President Taft sat down and they began to have a conversation like I say, we don't know what they said. We don't know what exactly passed between the two men, but we do know this, is that they began, both of them began laughing, and they began, to, uh, they began to clearly enjoy one another's company, and reconciliation was occurring right in front of everybody there in the restaurant. President Roosevelt had a train to catch, and uh, at the uh, end of their conversation together, the two men actually embraced and President Roosevelt exited the hotel, and the people actually clapped in the hotel to see their two former chief executives reconciling with one another. Within six months, having lost his son in some of the closing weeks of the combat in World War I, President Roosevelt died of a broken heart in January of 1919. Leading the procession to, uh, to his grave was President Taft. And in fact, President Taft was the last person standing at President Roosevelt's grave. And there is, uh, there is a famous uh, description of President uh, Taft standing at President Roosevelt's grave with his head bowed, staying there much longer than anyone else as he reflected perhaps on the friendship that they had had as younger men. You know, life is short. Uh, Jesus gives us ways to live that give some kind of quality and some kind of redemption to our life. And as we follow in that path, I can say that even if it doesn't always work out the way it did with Presidents Roosevelt and Taft, the reality is this. When we find ways to reconcile, when we show kindness, when we continue to have the great conversation where we engage with one another, recognizing the humanity in the other person, 
Then there is blessing that will follow, and there will be heavy burdens that will come from the backs of our souls. At Emory and Henry College, I am uh, convinced that what church-related higher education, as Emory and Henry has been doing it for nearly 200 years on behalf of the Holston Conference, it is necessary that we teach people what it means to have what Mr. Wesley referred to as the trained mind and the warm heart. John Wesley's admonition was this, is that even if we are to experience the greatest and finest education and we have not kindness and we have not a desire to treat others in the same spirit of their sacred worth that Christ himself redeemed each human being, then we have failed both as educational uh, institutions and in some respects we have failed at the great project we call being human. Pray for us at Emory and Henry. We'll continue to pray for you. As I say, it is wonderful to be in Lenore City today on this beautiful Sunday. This is a church that is vital. It is a church that I've known for many decades. And uh, you're in my prayers because what you're doing here in this wonderful community is valuable. And it matters that you are being faithful to the charge of being here at Trinity United Methodist Church. Know that you're always welcome uh, should you find yourself up 81 and uh, at exit 26, you come see us at Emory and Henry. You pray for us and we'll be praying for you. Thank you again, Pastor, for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you, Reverend Dr. Wells. We're glad to have you and, and so thankful for your sermon today. It's, it touched my heart as well as I'm sure others in the congregation. Our final hymn is 430, O Master, Let Me Walk With Thee. We were singing verses 1, 3, and 4 of 430. Please stand. May we remember God is always with us. May we remember that reconciliation is part of the gospel. And may we work toward that with all our hearts, our minds, and our souls. Go in peace. Amen.